We'll be at five o'clock uh, as our usual time. And uh, so good to have you with us. Um, this is, we know, the holiday season. We're right smack dab in the middle of it. And <clears throat> the holiday season is a lot of things. But one of the things that really make the holiday season so uh, wonderful is it's a time for family. I mean, you think about it, if, if there's any time during the year that family is going to travel great distances, spend lots of money on um, plane tickets, it's going to be during the holiday season. Um, you know, we, we, we talk about going home for the holidays. Um, we've got a, a Christmas carol that I will be home for Christmas. And so with all of that, I, I thought it would be appropriate for us to spend a few moments before we end our wonderful service. Thank you to the man that um, led us in our worship service this morning. I thought it would be good to talk about families and the godly importance of your family. I, I hope that yesterday... Your Christmas day was a relaxing day. I hope it was a spiritual day. That you had time with God to reflect upon Him and the blessings of all that He's done for us. But I hope it was a time to be with family as well. I think it's one of the, the things that... that we meant, remember the most is those holidays with the family. In fact, before Larissa went off to Idaho for the holidays, um, I, I put in a couple of home videos of Christmas past. I, um, I have a little hobby. I make sometimes videos, uh, home videos. And we just kind of reminisce about times with uh, family at Christmas time and a lot of the, the great moments were not always the perfect moments. A lot of funny moments and that we remember. And, and it was great to reminisce about those moments. Um, but the sad reality is that sometimes the holidays are not a time of family for people. They're not a time of warm wishes and good feelings a time of depression, a time where they're reminded of tragic loss, of being alone, or the, the terrible feeling of being alone. Um, and a lot of that is because they don't have their family for one reason or another. Families are so important to God and His plan. His plan for our lives and for our joy and for our well-being. And so what I want to do for a few moments is, is talk about some points of remembrance for us. About what makes life special through families. Now as I said, um, families are so important in, in the overall plan and purpose for God for our lives. That you would think that as you turn to the Bible, that it would just be filled with parenting instructions and, and, and passages that talk about um, how to raise your kids in a, in a godly way. But the reality is that the Bible is not written as a child raising instruction book. Even though families are so important and, and the raising of godly children it is so vital in God's plan, it's not written that way. Now, now, that doesn't mean there aren't passages that highlight some important factors about family and some of the important goals that God wants us to have as, as parents and, and even as grandparents. But the, the, the Bible is not an instruction book of parenting. And so we've got to take God's good word and, 
And, and we've got to find a, a, a way with that same purpose and same goal to raise those happy, godly families. In, in fact, as you look at the, the beginning of the Bible in the book of Genesis, um, you'll notice that there's a lot of families highlighted in that book. And their story is told. Uh, in fact, much of religion is based on family. That is the family that worships God. And the father is that, that spiritual leader. Some see him as kind of the, the priest of the family. And, and he instructs the family and, and, and prays for the family. And, and he builds the altars and offers the sacrifice as the family shows their reverence and awe for Yahweh. But as you look at the, the story of these families, a lot of it is, is not repeatable. It's not positive. You see a lot of mistakes. Favoritism that leads to, to ripping families apart. To families embracing the culture of that day. To bring new life in this world. They embracing a polygamy. Lying and deception. A lot of what we see in families is is what we learn from, but in a, in a very negative way. Probably, if we're thinking about a, a good book for us as Christians and, and family and parents, uh, Proverbs is that book. It's the most instructive book with the most passages about parenting and, and, and childhood and, and, and the family and what God expects of, of all that. And we're going to look at a lot of passages on from the book of Proverbs in this series. As you go on through the, the Old Testament, there are some families highlighted. Most of them are the king's family. And again, not a lot of repeatable action there. Not even David's family do we find a lot to build a, a, a godly, happy family with. And you get to the New Testament Christianity and you know families are coming to Christ and, and we are told that households are being saved. But there isn't a whole lot of detail there. <clears throat> There's all, not a whole lot of families that are highlighted. It's more looking at individuals coming to Christ and what they do for the Lord. In fact, one of the... the <laughs> highlighted apostle, apostles of the, of the New Testament, not even married, not even have kids. So what I want to do in this series is I want to take a look at some of these passages and, and remind us of some important points about the importance of family and God's overall purpose and, and in your lives. And I am not presenting this material as some, how some expert, some excellent father. The expert is my father, who you all know. And I've learned by many of my own mistakes. But I think these are so important that we understand. So the first point that I want to make is what I call created. This is something that's been highlighted in, in, in my study, in my faith the last couple of years. The importance of going back to the beginning. And to look at what God created from the very beginning and why he created it. There's so much in the world that man loves to start in the middle. And loves to tell you it should be this way or, or things should be that way. And it's all starting in the middle. It has nothing to do with God. It has nothing to do with what He created from the beginning. And as a, world, as, a, as a result, our world is in a mess. And families are in a mess. And families are being ripped apart. But what we need to understand is from the very beginning, we have this wonderful dynamic of, called a family. 
Because God created the family. It's, it's one of those things that people enjoy, and people embrace, and people want that in their life. They want to be a family. Even people that just completely give no regard to Yahweh. But what we need to understand is that God is the creator and God can tell us and, and show us how to be successful as a family. When God creates something, God creates it with purpose and with a goal. And so a lot of, uh, uh, when we decide, I want to start a family, I want to be part of a family, I want that in my life, what we need to do is go back to the very beginning. And, and at, why did God create this? What's the purpose? What's the, what's the goal or goals that God has in creating this? And this is not asked in the world today. People instead think, well, I'm going to create this family and I'm going to do it my way. And I'm going to use my structure. And those families suffer all sorts of pain and agony. They'll, they'll never be what God wants it to be. Because as the song says, they're doing it their way. I'm doing it my way. God created families with a structure, with an order, with responsibilities and they're not all the same as we talked about this morning bible class there is a body that the family is it's made up of members and not all the members have the same function have the same responsibility and again the world wants to turn that upside down but if we're going to have a family in our lives we need to get back to god's order and god's purpose and understand how all that works to Raise godly, happy families. Let's start in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 11, verse 29, where the proverb writer writes, He who troubles his own house will inherit the wind. Well, what does that passage tell us? It tells us that God wants good in family. He wants people to, to honor the dynamic of the family, and to promote it in a positive, loving way. He warns the one that want, brings trouble to his own house. Not just the house of someone else, but his own house. And so that dynamic is very important to God. He wants it to be promoted with love and joy. He doesn't want one to trouble the house. In 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3, some of that order we talked about that makes it a, a successful dynamic. But I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man, and man is the head of a woman, and God is the head of Christ. And there are people that will mock that. There are people that, that will laugh at that. Because they have been misinformed, they have been mistaught that this somehow leads to some type of abuse. And unfortunately, there are people that have abused this very thing, abused it in marriage, abused it in family. And, and it's those few that are used as the evidence that this doesn't work. It absolutely does work when you understand it. And so I flavor this, this passage with Ephesians chapter 5, verse 33, where Paul writes, Nevertheless, let each individual among you also love his own wife, even as himself, and let the wife see to it that she respect her husband. Titus chapter 2, wives are to love their husbands. There's no room for what people make this structure out to be. There's no room in God's kingdom, in God's family, for, for a husband to, to be anything but humble and loving and caring for his wife and his children. He does all that as being the head. 
And wives need to, to understand and respect and accept that that's the role God has given to her husband. And to promote that and, and to respect that. Knowing how difficult that God-given role is. God created families. And one of those purposes is the second point. And that is that families are to be enjoyed. It should be hard when children leave the house. It should be hard on parents when kids leave the house. I'll tell you, I still remember when the kids flew off leaving the house for the first time to go to college. I, I watched them all the way through security until they turned and I couldn't see them anymore. And, and your heart just gets pulled because that strong bond, that which you love, that which you enjoy is no longer with you, at least not physically. It's tough. Because that's the way it's supposed to be. It's wonderful to, to look back and, and to think of the good times, the fond memories. To have times like, like this family. I love this picture here. That's what family's all about sometimes. It's just enjoying one another, getting kind of crazy. Everyone in this family is having a good time except for the youngest one. He's like, I don't know what's going on here. Families will not always be about laughter, being crazy, having fun. But that also is part of the family. That you have a support system of unconditional love that will help you when the trials come. When you make mistakes. They're there with love and understanding so that you can work through those things. So that you can have those memorable family times. But what we need to understand is that those times, that, that close-knit, that, that joyful, happy family, bonded in God's love, it doesn't just happen by chance and circumstance. It takes work. It has to be cultivated. There's a number of, of, of Christians that know the importance of this. Trying to convolt, uh, cultivate a, a atmosphere of love, of acceptance, of God. In, in, in their family life, in their daily life. But the, the unfortunate thing is that there are some families where it's not that way. It's a culture of negativity. It's a culture of abuse. It's a culture of individualism instead of interdependence. Now, God created families for us to enjoy and to be helped by. I love this Psalm 127. Verse 3 through 5, <clears throat> Behold, children are a gift of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. How blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They shall not be ashamed when they speak with their enemies in the gate. I, I love that last line. They're, they're not ashamed even to their enemies, to, to talk about their family. They're not ashamed of their family. Their children are a gift from the Lord. And blessed is the man that has a quiver full of them. In Colossians 3, verse 13 and 14, it really is a great passage to explain how we develop that, that bond of love and unity in the family. Where Paul writes, bearing with one another, 
forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. And beyond all these things, put on love which is the perfect bond of unity. These passages we, we think of as, as Christianity passages definitely need to be in the home. They need to be in the family. We need to bear with one another, be patient with one another, care for one another. Even crazy Uncle Jimmy. We all have a crazy Uncle Jimmy, don't we? And we all have to bear with Uncle Jimmy too. We need to be, able, be, be willing to forgive each other, but in the same regard, we need to have enough humility to know, I, I made a mistake. Will you forgive me? To, to, to have that heart of repentance. To realize that just as the Lord forgave us, we need to forgive others. And, and to create that bond of love, which he says is the perfect bond of unity. If this is the way it works out in families, then today you need to get on your knees and thank God for your family. If that's what you have. But there are families that are not close like this that don't have the bond of unity. I, I would imagine if, if we think about Christians holding grudges, probably the family dynamic is where that is found most. Not talking to a brother or sister or mother or father, because if something would happen, if someone's not willing to repent, someone's not willing to forgive, they don't have enough love for each other that they're willing to work through those things. God created our families that we might enjoy them. But in order to cultivate all of that, in order to have that in our family, families need to understand that there are certain stumbling blocks, certain pitfalls that they need to Avoid as best they can. To look out for. But Paul says that we, we are not ignorant of the schemes of the devil. I want to tell you, Satan knows how important families are to God. He knows exactly how important it is. He knows a strong, godly family is going to make it harder to attack the souls of those Christians. And so, on his radar screen is your family. He will attack your family often. <clears throat> We're going to talk about some of these pitfalls for just a moment. But I want you to again look at that picture. That's not what God wants in a family. You got kids that feel completely insecure. Insecure of the family. Insecure about love and mom and dad's love for one another. And maybe even asking, what did I do to cause this? Families can get very ugly. And I look at these kids and maybe some of you can relate to it. Again, if you can't, then... Get on your knees and thank God. But this doesn't just happen overnight. This, this, this is where these stumbling blocks, again, create a certain family dynamic that's not godly. So, so what are some of these pitfalls that we need to be aware of and these stumbling blocks we need to avoid? Well, number one, obviously, selfishness. There is no place for selfishness. Where family members are taught just to think about themselves. Where we're just a bunch of individuals, five, six, seven individuals, all living on the same roof. Along with that is pridefulness. 
family members that are so prideful that they're unwilling to work on self, unwilling to look in the mirror and say, yeah, that was my bad. Will you forgive me? Fathers who think, well, I'm the father, and what I say, it's going to go. Even when what I say is wrong. Mothers who get so angry that they bring the wrong kind of discipline on their children and not willing to admit that. Children who are not being respectful and loving of their, of their parents and, and realizing what a gift from God their parents are. This is where the grudges come in. But Christians, no, there's no place for these. And we cultivate a, an atmosphere of love, of joy. Every member is important in that family. And we care for one another. We tell each other how important they are each and every day. I, I, I heard Robert saying this to his grandkids just this morning here. You're important. And we need to hear that. What about this control? Oh, that's a big one. Family members that have to be in control has to be their way. And so they try to control everything and control their family so that the outcome will be exactly what they want. It doesn't work. You can't control people and all of their actions. You can't control every outcome. And in fact, the older your kids get, the more you try to control them, the more destruction you bring on a family. You're not in control. God is, and you need to let Him have that control. Control things that God is giving you control of. But ultimately, as parents, we want to hand that control over our kids. Well, they're still under our roof. So that if they make the wrong decision, as they make a mistake, we are there to what? Understand. To walk them through it. To instruct them. To love them through it. Not to control everything they do. What about this? Emotionally charged. And, and what I mean by that is, when we talk about family, we're talking about intimate, intimate relationships. And whenever you have that close, intimate relationship like you do in a family, there's going to be deep emotion in it. They are emotional relationships. And that's what makes them so wonderful to be able to share life and to share the great things on an intimate level. But it also can, can be a pitfall. It also can be hard if we are so emotionally charged that I've seen parents say, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to discipline my kid because I love my kid. And a complete misunderstanding of what God says about sparing the rod. He doesn't call that love. He calls that hate. Parents who are not emotionally strong enough to have the hard conversations. To do the tough things that it takes to be a parent. That emotions can override what is good and right in a family. And then as we talked about before, what kind of atmosphere are we creating a lot of times it's just negative. We promote, complain about this and complain about that. And, and that all can lead to abuse, verbal abuse. It could even lead to physical abuse. And what you get is a picture like we saw on the prior, prior slide. The thing is, if we have fallen to these, these all can be repented of. These all can be changed. It, 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 if God can raise 
a dead life. The deadness of someone's body and bring them back to life. He can take a family that's, that's fallen to these things and he can resurrect it in love and unity. But we have to hand it over to him. We got to avoid these pitfalls so we can have families the way God wants them to be. Proverbs 20, verse 20 He who curses his father or his mother, his lamp will go out in time of darkness. Imagine such a son or daughter. What was developed in their life? What, what, what are they thinking that they would treat their mother and father in such a way? God is against such behavior, such attitudes. In, in 1 Timothy 3, verse 4 and 5, even a, 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 to be a shepherd in, in God's church, God says, he must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. But if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? God says the family and, and, and how you're able to structure that family, and raise your kids is so important that if you can't do that with your own family, he doesn't want you to be a shepherd of his children. It's important to God. In Matthew 18, verse 7, Woe to the world because of its stumbling blocks. For it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come, but woe to that man through whom the stumbling block comes. Look what he says about the man that brings the stumbling block. We need to avoid those. Matthew 16, 23, look at this. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, for you are a stumbling block to me. Peter, called by Jesus, Satan, told to get behind him because he's being a stumbling block. But, but Peter loves Jesus. He is constantly trying to show Jesus he loves him more than anyone else. But how did Peter become a stumbling block? Jesus says, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. That's all it takes. Set your mind, try to, to create your family with man's ideology. And you'll never have the family that God says you can have. And finally, as we close, number four, families are the cornerstone of society. I think it's very clear that one of the reasons that God created family is that in the community would be built strong families, loving families built on the foundation of God's truth, standing for God's ways, God's morality. Because he knows Satan's going to chip away at it. Families that will stand up and say, as for me and my family, we're going to serve the Lord. Many of society's problems, you go into the inner city and you'll see. Even experts who don't believe in God will tell you. That all the dysfunction of society, all the societal problems we see and recognize go right back to the home. Homes that are dysfunctional, homes, homes that have been torn apart, homes where they've been torn apart by adultery. Single parent homes where the parent has to work two, three jobs just to, to make ends meet. And so because that parent is gone so much to work and provide, because they're a single parent... The children are home alone and they get in, involved in all the wrong activities and all the wrong influences. As he says in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, Paul says, bad company corrupts good morals. And that's what happens to these kids. The parent who leaves, leaves because God wants them to be happy. But happy in their definition is nothing more than selfishness. 
whatever makes me happy, that's what I'm going to do. And it doesn't make me happy to stay here any longer. Crime, violence, drugs. It all goes right back to these problems of the broken home. Families are so important to God. Proverbs 22, verse 1. A good name is to be more desired than great riches. Favor is better than silver and gold. That was what it was like in the old days, where it's all about the name, the reputation of the family. Everyone took that seriously. Everyone thought, I wore, I wear that family name, and I, I have to bring pride and honor to my family. But that also has brought a, a bad side to it, where... People sweep things under the carpet, sweep the problems under the carpet. They ignore it because they have to uphold the family name. They don't want anyone to know the problems that they're having. That's absolutely wrong. Acts 10, verse 2. Look at how this man is described, this family man. A devout man and one who feared God with all of his household. And gave many alms to the Jewish people and prayed to God continually. As God speaks of Cornelius and, and, and introduces him to the reader, he's a family man, he's a godly man. But here's the incredible thing is, he's not a Christian at this point. His family are not Christians. But God changes all of that in Acts chapter 10. And just imagine this man, how he's described before becoming a Christian. What kind of <clears throat> Christian family he had after being baptized. Strong, devout, caring, loving, godly families. That's what he's all about. Romans 16, verse 3, Greet Prisca and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who for my life risked their own necks, to whom not only do I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles also greet the church that is in their home. Here's a couple. We don't read of their kids, but we always read of them as a couple. Aquila and Priscilla. I think everywhere they went, Rome, Corinth, Ephesus. They not only use their family, their marriage to promote God, but the church met in their house. They did whatever they could to promote God using their family. You see, we as individual Christians can do a lot for God, but imagine taking that into a family dynamic, into a group dynamic, and then using the family to promote God. There is strength in numbers. I'm going to put a pin right here. We're going to come back to this, make some more points. But I hope yesterday and each and every day. You look at your family with great love and appreciation and thanksgiving. And if not, fix that. Start praying about it. Bow your knees to God and say, God, I need your help here. And you're going to see incredible things happen. Happen in your family. You see, I have behind me these words, by going to the cross, Jesus created a family of salvation. One of the leading, one of the leading metaphors for the church is God's family. And everything that I talked about, everything I talked about as to our physical families, a blessing from God today is equal to God's spiritual family all that we talked about could be applied to this family and needs to be applied to this family right here. Who's going to do it? You, you want me to do it all? No. Each and every member needs to look at this family we're part of 
Are we what we just described today? Is our atmosphere, our culture, what God wants it to be? Is our leadership what God wants it to be? Or are we failing in some of these areas and need to address them? I want you to think about that as we begin this new year in the Brea family. If you're not part of that family, why don't you change that this morning? We can bring you to Christ. We can strengthen that relationship. We can make you obedient to become a child of God, to become a brother and sister in Jesus Christ. If we can help you do that, why don't you come? Let us know how we can help you as together we stand and as we sing.